So let me introduce myself and this presentation. Dennis already read the title. Um, nowadays, I the first three slides are on me and then it goes into biopesticides. So I work on three fields today. I bring people together in the world and help them to build trust in each other. Um, I work on the plant protection without borders. Uh, plant protection is a question of nature and nature doesn't really have national borders. If we would be leaving, there would be no borders. And then I help people build a business behind the whole thing. And that's what I call economic development at eye level. So all this is connected. This is my life story. I'm not going to take you through it, but um, I have been to all continents and I lived on three continents. So I really consider myself to be a global citizen. Here you see the countries that we are currently working in. Um, South America comes a little short. I guess that's because I don't speak Spanish or Portuguese. But as they speak English, you see we are there anyway. So from this map, you see that we look at the world without political borders. There are no political borders on this map. And that is why we are saying, as there is only one world, there should only be one data package. Let me show you what a data package is. So starting in the upper left and then following the arrows, starting in the upper left, society has past problems. And not only in agriculture, but also in our living spaces. In agriculture, we are dealing with plant diseases, we are uh, with, with uh, uh, insect pests, with weeds, with rodents, and the same we do in parks and golf courses and in hotels and restaurants and so on. As that is the case, companies called registrants in the regulatory system have products. But before they can start producing and marketing their products and before farmers or anybody else can use these products, they have to pass by the authorities and they have regulations with which they conduct risk assessments and efficacy trials. And now here is the data package. That's the package of information that a company has to compile and give to the national regulator before they get product approval. All product approvals are given per use. So a use is a combination of a site, a pest, a product, and a country. A site can be a cassava field, it can be an apple orchard, it can be uh, a golf course, but it can also be, for example, in the case of tomatoes, tomatoes uh, in the field and tomatoes in a greenhouse are two different sites. If you do the math, and we will do this right after, we are reaching 66 million combinations. And that does not even distinguish yet between greenhouse crop and field crop. So we do the count, agriculture and society. The number of sites in agriculture is about 10,000, not yet distinguishing between greenhouse and field. And in society, we count about 1,000 sites. The number of pests would be about 10. Now, if you go and you talk to a farmer, they will say, yeah, 10 is a joke they will rather put it at around 30 to 40 pests that farmers have to deal with. We are taking 10 here or I'm taking 10 here because we want to be conservative. We do not want to inflate the number. Number of products has to be at least three with different modes of action so that we can uh, prevent the development of resistance but also so that farmers can actually trade the crops they are growing. 
And then we have numbers of countries, about 200. It's not quite 200, but some countries have several regulators, like the United States. And then you do the math and you get to 60 million for agriculture and 60 million uh, uses in society, which leads us to the 66 million. These 66 million cannot be accomplished by any country, not by the government, not by the companies. It's absolutely impossible. So this picture of this sinking ship, I have chosen to reflect the situation of um, regulators and companies, for example, in Germany or in France, the US, Canada, Australia. So all these countries that have a lot of scientists doing this kind of work. Then we come to countries like Spain, Italy, Mexico, Greece, not sure how well South Africa is off. I don't know the regulator yet. I think their situation is worse because the first countries I mentioned, they have about 300 scientists for this kind of work, 300. I do not know how many other countries have. They typically have something like around 20 to 30. And very clear, you can achieve even less with 20 to 30 than you can do with 300. Then we are coming to the developing world. And that situation is, <laughs> I mean, all countries have at least half a scientist for this work, half. Many countries have one and a half scientists to do this work. And this is why the products are not coming to, for example, the African continent. When I say the products are not coming, then I mean the newer products, the reduced risk products and the biopesticides. So as that situation, as the 66 million cannot be accomplished by anybody, but everybody works on something, we are getting into a mess. We have a mess, a regulatory mess that is based on administrative differences, not on safety. That causes trade barriers. Let me give you an example in 2000, I think 2018 or 2019, one of the two. Um, Ghana tried to sell its cocoa yield, its cocoa harvest to Japan in the harbor uh, in Japan, the border services pulled a sample. They found residues of 2,4-D. And 2,4-D is not allowed for use on cocoa in Japan. There are many reasons that explain it. One of them being that Japan doesn't grow any cocoa. So what happens in this situation is that the border is closed. Border is closed means the captain cannot unload the shipment. So the cocoa could not leave the boat. And because this happens so very often, the IMO, so the International Maritime Organization, has come up with a regulation that says that any crop that sinks has to be taken 50 nautical miles away from shore before it can be dumped in the ocean. And for everything that floats, which includes cocoa, cocoa floats, they have to take it out 25 nautical miles. Why is that so? Oh, there's a comment in the chat. Okay, yes, no. thank you. <laughs> so here's the example. So. Let me just close the chat here again so I can see my screen there. So this is the example um, that I just mentioned. It was published in a Ghanaian journal, but it is not published in the countries that really cause the problem. It comes up in the WTO publications. It comes up in international publications, but it doesn't come up, for example, in an American newspaper or a Canadian or a German. 
I have tried in Germany really all the big journals, all the big um, journalists, and they don't want to touch the topic with a pole. So what do we do? And then who is we? We, that is, I would say probably around 2,000 people around the world have come together under OECD, which is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, head office in Paris. And OECD is a secretariat for all kinds of government cooperation on all kinds of topics, one of them being pest control. And what they do with their work is they try to bring the number 200 down to one. How does that work? So right now, in form of data packages for the world, you have to develop one data package per country. There is no company that manages that. Even the big multinationals, they don't. So this would be the leading to the 66. So no, the 66 million combinations. Every country receives different information. That's a big, big issue. If governments ask for different information, they receive different information. And then they cannot reach... Um, compatible or identical regulatory decisions. That's a big problem when it comes to use pattern of a product, when it comes to MRLs and all that. So in this situation, cooperation and harmonization are impossible. Now, under the leadership of OECD, there have been, um, starting in 1994, all the tools have been developed for companies to look at the world as one, the way I do, and for regulators to cooperate. So instead of 66 million, you are then down to 330,000 combinations, which is still an awful lot, right? But if the regulators cooperate, then all in a sudden we have several thousand evaluators instead of the half, one and a half, 20 or 30 or 300 per country. Add them all up, have them cooperate, and then we can achieve the 33,000. What is currently in place, and this is in place for chemicals and biologicals. So the OECD has developed the tools for chemical products and for biological products. For growers, they can find out what farmers in other countries are using to control uh, a pest. They can compare that to what they have available to themselves, and they can pick everything that they don't have yet and list it in a database as what is called a need. So if you are in South Africa and you grow mangoes and you have a pest that you don't know how to control, you can find out which products other countries are using, and then you can demand that you get this product as well, which helps you then to trade. Once you have done that, the system or your need becomes part of an international cooperation under the Minor Use Foundation. Now, they also cannot accomplish 66 million. But what they do is they coordinate the trials across crops and countries so that regulators can all get the same information and can then cooperate so that we bring the number down. Then comes the next step. Then comes the work of um, the registrants, the companies. For them, there are five tools in place. One is a way to ask the different governments, okay, what do you want from me to give me the approval of my product? What kind of information do I have to send you? And if you ask the same question to all governments, the chances are that the replies you get are more harmonized than if you ask different questions. This is why we created this unified form. 
As a reply, you get a document that will include all data requirements from the different countries. And then you can switch over to OECD. That means you can use OECD um, documents to build your data package and to conduct studies. And then you can build a zip folder and send the whole thing to all the governments you want to send it to. So my dream is that one day there will be a central portal for all 200 countries. That would be great. I'm not sure I'll get old enough to uh, you know, make that happen, but if you all work on it, we will achieve it. So, and then comes the last step to complete the circle. This is what the regulators are doing. They have to do all their evaluation. And for that also OECD has developed all the tools. It's just this last thing, which is not OECD, but it is spreading like a wildfire. Farmers using their smartphones to read labels instead of reading labels that are pinned to, to packages. So we are using this database. Um, right now, it is still a proprietary database, but there's many ways to access the information in this database. So if you have any crop in mind and you wonder what kind of products could be used to protect this crop, um, ask me and uh, we can find that information in Homologa. In different countries, it's available through different venues and maybe one day we will have it open access. But right now, that's not the case yet. But we are working on that as well. So then we have all the tools from the OECD. I really suggest go onto the OECD website. It's amazing all the information you find there. And if you then go to the search button and you go to pesticides, you will get to the pesticide part of the OECD work. And then, as I said, we are working with the Minor Use Foundation, which is built on the different minor use programs around the world. So the Americans are part of it, the Canadians are part of it, the Europeans are part of it, Australia, Japan, and so on. And there are also several African countries connected to the Minor Use Foundation, and I wish it would be more. But for that, we have to spread the word, and this is what I'm trying to do today. So let's go into the biopesticides. What's the challenge? for Africa specifically. In 2016, fall armyworm, so um, Spodoptera frugiperda, was detected uh, in Nigeria. That this would happen, we know since the 80s. We knew this pest would make it to Africa. It started off in South America, and it's spreading around the world. So we knew it would make it to Africa eventually. Um, there is a big working group on invasive alien species, IAS, that are trying to prevent these kind of things from happening or at least to, to catch things before they spread. But in this situation, things failed miserably. So 2016, <laughs> first found in Nigeria. This is the way it looks like. It's a moth that lays, lays eggs. From the eggs hatch the L1s. They start eating and they eat on over 560 plant species. So they eat pretty much everything that we grow in agriculture. It's absolutely incredible. There is no blockage to this moth. And as they eat, they get bigger and bigger, and then they pupate, and then you have the next generation of adults, and then get the new eggs. In Africa, fall armyworm has no natural enemies. 
There are no uh, specific diseases. There are no parasitoids. There's basically no natural control. And so what happens is when you have a field like this one and you come back the next day and it looks like this, that is what fall army worm left you with. Corn after an attack of fall army worm. But as I said, you know, 560 plants. Here you see, so even the corn that they do not eat all together, you might still find some corn husks on the stems. They are contaminated as well. There's nothing you can sell. And as I said, many different crops here, uh, a cotton pot. It's, it's terrible. It's really terrible. So by April 2017, it has reached that far. And, and here now they have all the pictures. So I think it's 2018, but it's behind the pictures there. No, December 2017. Oh, my God. We could have acted. We could have. And we knew what to do. But we didn't get organized in time to take action. So now fall army worm is there to stay. <gasps> Oops, sorry. No, okay. So fall army worm. In Africa, there was no product available to farmers, which makes sense because the pest hadn't been there before. But in the rest of the world, there were already 211 products available. Marketed, manufactured by 596 different companies and 27 of these products being biopesticides. And these biopesticides, they need to come to Africa. And as you saw all over Africa, because fall armyworm does not respect political borders. So use the OECD approach. And here what you see is the list of data requirements with which I want to show you how we work and how I wish you guys are going to work in the future. The OECD has pulled together all the data requirements around the world for microbial pesticides meaning pesticides that have a microbe or several microbes as active ingredients in the product. This document is over 50 pages thick with a lot of legal wording, which as scientists, we don't really need. So what we have done is we have taken all the data requirements that are listed, took out the legal, legal wording and transferred the whole thing into an Excel file that is now 152 lines long. When you start opening up the lines, then you see what's hidden behind it. And I know you cannot read this. This is too small, which is fine, because I just want you to understand the principle. In the first column, and we are doing this for every country we are working with, in the first column, here, I mean, after the, the requirements, we put an R when the requirement exists. When a country says, uh, no, this is conditionally required, you know, just wait if you need it down the road, or a country says it's not required or it's not even applicable, then that's what we put there. We don't have to deal with it. As we work globally, we always say R everywhere because we want to build one data package and you can send a regulator all the information you want. It's not that they are saying don't send more. What they are saying is don't send less. So that's why we are saying, okay, we'll just send everything anybody ever has thought of. Then we are defining what kind of information, what type of information we have to provide. Many of those lines are really administrative information. Things like the name of the company or the name of the product. But then you're coming to scientific studies. 
and some scientific studies need to be done, yes. But when it comes to microbes, you do use um, all the scientific literature that is published by anybody in the world, any university, any user, uh, uh, um, uh, research organization, there is a lot. And so when you collect the information on a specific microbe and you write it all together, you put it all together like a review article, then what you submit is a scientific review for this one data requirement. That would be another scientific review. This would be another scientific study. Then we have scientific bridges. The scientific bridge is um, the connection between um, the work that has been done on a micro, different from your, yours that you have in the lab, but you can bridge it. So that's why we call it the scientific bridge. And then we call, there we prepare scientific rationales. Some things are just scientifically not possible. Like you cannot determine the melting point of uh, a microbe. They simply don't melt. And there would again be administrative information. So that's the way we work ourselves through. Then we are determining from whom we want to get that information. So here now I have put um, Mr. Drolle for the administrative information, Jane Doe for a scientific study, Will Smith for a scientific review, Will Smith again for a scientific review, uh, Jane Doe for another scientific study. I mean, if they're doing the one study, why not the other? And then uh, two people for a scientific bridge, which is typically a scientist who has experience with um, a similar microbe, similar to the one I'm working with. And then the scientific rationale, which can be a scientist from several uh, fields, from several disciplines. And then there's again, administrative information. Now, in all, as I said earlier, there's 152 lines to be filled. So I really don't want to make this uh, appear easier than it is. It isn't, it is work. But if we do it systematically like this way, then we can build one data package for the world. And then we can give that data package to every government that has a problem or where the farmers have problem to deal with a pest organism. So in the case of fall armyworm, let's build the data package for a microbe that controls fall armyworm. Let's build the data package once and then give it to all African regulators. Then in the last column, what we put is a date. So let's say administrative information, April 1st, maybe today I should have said April 5th, because that is really easy to write up. Scientific studies sometimes take a little time. So I have put it out a little bit, July 15th. The scientific review can be done before that. There's another scientific study. And then a scientific bridge really has to wait for the results of the scientific studies. Because you need to have the, the, the two poles that hold the bridge. You need what is already known, so you can do a scientific review. But then you need the results from your own tests to build the bridge. Scientific rationale, same thing as a scientific review. You can write at any time. And then when you're through with all 152 documents, then you put it into the template from, that has been developed by OECD. This is here. Um, there are, is the microbial guidance main document that is free of charge available, downloaded from the OECD website, open it and start entering your information. The appendixes are uh, mainly explanations of acronyms and of formulation types and things like that. So your information goes chapter by chapter by chapter 
same way as it is numbered in the list here, in this list that I just showed you there, and you put it into the main document. When you have entered the last page of information, then you use the OECD software, which creates a zip folder, and then you can send it to all the governments. Now, the governments also have their OECD guidance templates. Again, the guidance main document, they can use that. And then the question obviously is, how do you get them to do that? Um, there is such a thing as a global joint review. It's a little bit a big word because so far, I think only 10 or 12 countries have participated in those reviews. Africa has not participated in any of them. And it was only done with, uh, with my uh, chemicals. But there is this um, guidance document that the OECD has pulled together for regulators to cooperate in a joint review. What we currently try to organize, and Dennis and us, we are working together on this. We are trying to make the first African joint review. So, as I said earlier, there was no involvement from Africa in the global joint reviews of chemical products. So I suggest we do now an African joint review with all 57 countries on a biopesticide. The idea is that um, every country sends one evaluator from their regulatory office and one scientist from a university. They sit together for five or six days and conduct a review of the full data package. So that gives us 114 people they will be divided across 12 groups and they will read the information that the companies have that company has provided to them in the data package on the last day they come to a conclusion for example the conclusion being yes we want to allow the product because it is safe to humans and the environment we suggest the product is being allowed for use on the following crops. You apply so much of the product in these time intervals. And then comes the point where every country has to take its own decision. That means you take this paper that all 57 countries now have, go home and have the regulator stamp the document, which typically means you stamp the use label. Now I'm already done with what I wanted to show you. I have no clue how much time I used. Okay, I think we're good in time, so we can really discuss. Um, I just want to come out here with two quotes, one from Nelson Mandela who said, it always seems impossible until it's done. So when I talk to people in, in uh, different countries, including in Africa, there's always a lot of hesitation, wondering, hmm, and I don't know. And in my mind, it has already all happened. I have planned it so often. I've organized it so often. We really only have to do it. It has to arrive in people's head. So that's what I'm trying today. I'm trying to put it into your head. And then what I also really like is from Barak. Change will not come if we wait for some other person or some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the change that we seek. So all the tools that I showed you today, they are in fact there. You can go online, you can look them up. They already exist. If we are not doing it, if we are not doing an African joint review, it is because we choose not to do it. But I hope it's going to be different and I hope you're all going to support this development and I hope that maybe in a year or maybe 18 months from now, um, 
we will be able to publish the fact that the African Joint Review has taken place and that a product to control fall armyworm is now Africa-wide available. Thank you.